There we go. And uh, so we're going to be in the book of Ruth, last chapter, chapter four. It's been an amazing uh, book for me as I go through it and I study and then uh, share with you guys and get your insight. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Lindsay uh, from uh, Scotland, she asked a, a very important question, a very good question, something that had evaded my mind. She said, uh, how come Naomi and her, her two daughter-in-laws didn't have children while they were in Moab? Very good question. These are the questions and comments I like to hear after we end our Bible study. We go to our audience in, in Zoom because it opens my mind to things that are even deeper. We go deep in the Bible study, but... Things, you know, you miss, and there's things in the peripheral that you miss. And uh, so you guys on uh, uh, the join on Zoom, you guys um, remind me of these things and encourage me to go deeper. So I want you guys to consider uh, different things like that as we go through the scripture. And that's how we grow together. The Bible says that uh, like iron sharpens iron something or other. And it's not just men. It's it's women also. And so... Uh, all right, so the closing chapter of uh, the book of Ruth, and uh, it's going to be some amazing insights here. If you're a student of the Word of God, there's going to be some amazing insights that are just going to carry you mentally and spiritually to a far deeper place uh, with the Lord than, uh, well, than many of us could even imagine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we ask you that you would teach us again. Lord, that you would wash away all of our sins, every distraction that might come to mind. That you would wash out so many things that we've learned that uh, really have no place in your word. Valuable things, maybe, for life and different things like that here on earth. But, Lord, we come together on Saturdays to study your word so that we can know you better, so that we can understand how you think, how you feel, what our calling is, so that we can see that more clearly, so that we can live for you and not ourselves and not for anything or anybody else but you. And so we ask you, Lord, to bless us with your presence this morning, this evening, if, if for those who are in Europe, and uh, teach us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good morning, Randy. I'm glad you joined us. If you have your Bible, I know you have a Bible. Turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 4. All right? So, a lot of people are asking, where are we going to go after the book of Ruth? Well, I'm not sure yet. Probably the book of Acts. If we do, it's going to be a long run. There's 28 chapters in that book. But, uh, hey, um, we have the time, I guess. Um, I want to open up with this uh, last chapter of the book of Ruth, uh, reminding us of what Paul said in his letter to the Philippians in regards to God's work in our lives. In the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And he could have added there, no matter how stupid we are, no matter how many attempts we make on purpose or accidentally to screw up the plan, it doesn't matter. No matter if you didn't, if you were a drug addict and you didn't get clean in the church, you got clean in a 12-step program. No matter. God is going to complete the work that he began in you because he's faithful to do it. And he's going to do it until when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. That means that from now until the time that we meet face to face with Jesus when we take our last breath or should the rapture come. At that point, God will complete the work that he has began, begun in each of us. And so those two things are not going to happen until God completes the work. Now, if you're like me, and you've taken inventory, and you say, you know, not only have I screwed up so badly in my past, but man, even as I somehow overcame those things, I continue 
in my sin, character defects, shortcomings, I continue to screw things up. And I hate to admit it, but sometimes it's even on purpose. And though I say I hate it and why did I end up here again and make the same horrible choice, I still continue to do it. Well, God says, I am bigger than that. I am smarter than you are. I, the plan that I have, nothing, not you, not Satan, not the world is going to thwart the plan that I have for you. That's how good he is. That's how smart God is. And we're going to see that play out. We've already seen it play out in the previous three chapters of this book. But we're going to see it all come together in this fourth chapter. And You know, you walk away from this book and you say, God is more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. And he's smarter. He's just brilliant. He's like this expert chess player. And he's always five and even ten moves in front of his opponent. And he's going to get the work done. And so... um. The he there in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, verse 16, it says, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. That he there is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being the third person of the, of the Trinity, the third invisible person of the Trinity. He is the Holy Ghost. He's invisible. And so... Again, you know, if your experience has been anything like mine before inviting uh, Jesus into your life, you know, you had dreams, you had ideas, you had goals, aspirations, and then you had strategies and you had plans or paths to achieve those goals. And you thought, you know, once I get to that place in my career, in relationships, when I get, you know, 55 years clean in my 12-step program, when I get that big uh, part in the movies, in my acting career, whatever it is, when I have that certain number of children with my wife, whatever it is, when I get to that place, then I'm going to be happy, then I'm going to be satisfied, and then everything is going to be fine. But if you're young, and some of you not so young, what you don't know that some of us older people know, some of us who walked with the Lord long enough know, is that life can be very complicated. And there's all kinds of unexpected events that come along, difficulties, you could call them obstacles. And some of them, if we're going to be honest, are self-inflicted. And so we end up being... Or, or, or becoming, I should say, this victim of all kinds of unexpected consequences. And if we get to that point, when we get to that point, I guess I should say, we have two choices. Number one, we can just move forward as best we can to the bitter ends. Or number two, we can look to the Lord and we can offer him the rest of our lives. Whatever we have left, we can say, Lord, I've messed it all up. You take the reins now, please. And if we should choose option number two, let's be honest, we don't know. I heard Jim talking about it before we started. We don't know how the Lord is going to work things out. We don't know. Anybody who says they know is a liar. I don't care if they're a Christian, pastor, deacon. I don't care if the Pope says that he's a liar. We do not know. That's why faith is required in our relationship with the Lord, because we don't know. But there are some things that we do know. What do we know? Well, if we're paying close attention at all, what we do know is that God loves us. You know, I hear people, so many people, and I'm going to take a commercial break here to talk about my friends and family in 12-step programs. They're desperate. Oh, God, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They get clean. And then after they're clean for two years, five years, they say, oh, the God of the Bible, he's a punishing God. Oh, I don't know about that God. Oh, I, I have a God of my own understanding. My God is the universe. My God is the other. Wait a minute. You forgot that when you called out to him, he rescued you. Now, all of a sudden, he's the bad guy? No. If we have the ability to be honest with ourselves, he is the only God, he is the only person or thing that loved us more than 
anybody else or anything else could have loved us. That's the truth. So we don't know how he's going to work things out, but we do know that he loves us. The evidence is there. And we know that he knows us better than we know ourselves. And lastly, we know if there's one scripture besides John chapter 3, verse 16, that you should memorize. I believe it's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And I go to my Bible to that place every once in a while just to make sure it's still there. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says that all things, all right, A-L-L, -L, all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. That is you and I. But Mario, you don't know what came down last week. It doesn't matter. It comes under the umbrella of all things. And it's going to work out for your good. But Mario, I did it. It was my fault. And I knew better. And I did it anyway. Stop. Shh. All things. But Mario, I just can't see it. Then you're like me. You're going to be totally reliant on the invisible third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to work things out. Have you ever seen him, Mario? No, he's a ghost. I've never seen him. Has he ever spoken to you audibly? No, if he did, I would probably die. Then how could you say he's there at work, Mario? Because his fingerprints are all over my life as I look back at my life. It's undeniable. It's simply undeniable. So it's in this frame of mind that we left off in Ruth chapter 3. Because in chapter 3, if you remember, Naomi and, 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 and her family, they made a horrible choice when there was a famine in Bethlehem, in the land of Israel, in the promised land, there was a famine. And they said, you know what? They said, pray. They said, have faith in God. But let's be practical. Let's get the heck out of here. Let's go to Moab where we know there's food. Sound like a good idea, Naomi? Sounds like a good idea, Limelech. How about the boys? Ask the boys. Kilian and M Melon, you guys want to go? I mean, there's food. They said, of course. What's there to think about? And they left. Turned out to be a horrible mistake. Had they trusted God more than their own intellect and ideas and philosophies, they would have never suffered the tragedy. And what was the tragedy? Do you remember in chapter one, both or all three, Elimelech, uh, Naomi's husband, and Kilion and Melon, their two sons, they all died in Moab. By that time, the two boys had married two women, Moabite women. One of them stayed behind. The other one, Ruth, she returned with Naomi to Bethlehem completely broke. Both of them were widows. They had absolutely no hope whatsoever but God. Every time I read that in my Bible, I underline it. But God. That's the turning point there and so Naomi and, and Ruth they get back to uh to 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 Bethlehem there and, and and in doing so really it's a picture of repenting and turning back to the Lord that's really what we see there we do we've done that before and when they get back to Bethlehem the people of Bethlehem they celebrate and they say oh Naomi we're so glad you're back we missed you we love you we talk about you all the time and they celebrated but Naomi whose name means pleasant she said listen don't call me Naomi don't call me pleasant call me bitter because my life is bitter and I would imagine at that point she began to tell the people about her experience in Moab how she lost her husband and her two sons and she comes home with nothing and then I told you last week that in this chapter, chapter 4, we're also going to find out that before the family left to Moab, they forfeited, all right, their land in Bethlehem. We're not going to get into it again. We already talked about it. But whenever you forfeited your land, a Jewish person, when they forfeited their land in Israel, it could be purchased back by somebody who had the money. And if that person were a close relative, keep that in mind as we go through this. And by the way, if you're just joining us now for the first time, you could go to our YouTube channel, 
Lahana will put it into the chat, or my wife or somebody will, and then you can go back and listen to the first three chapters there. Um, but for now, Naomi was absolutely sure, like I was at so many times, points in, in, in my life, she was absolutely sure that she would spend the rest of her life the victim of her bad decisions and consequences. But again, God, he loves us so much. You say, well, Mario, you know, you're a pastor. You do this Bible study. You're supposed to say that God loves us. Maybe I'm supposed to say that. But it is entirely true. Not only does he love us, but because he loves us, he is so willing to forgive and to start all over. And I, you know, I, I become so frustrated at times because I think to myself, these people in the 12-step programs, why don't they get it? Just take an honest inventory of your past and you will see plainly that the Lord's been with you the whole time. And he has forgiven you and he's given you many chances to start over and you need him and, and and he loves you and you know what we should also know by now that he is absolutely expert at making beauty out of ashes and he works things out in ways both visible and invisible all day long with all of his people so Several times in the story of, of, of Ruth here, we've read, and it just so happened. It just so happened that Ruth was in Boaz field. It just so happened that there was a close relative. It just so happened. And it mentions it as if though these are coincidences taking place in Naomi's life and in Ruth's life, but they were not coincidences. It was the invisible spirit of God saving them, redeeming them, restoring them, recovering them, them being the life of Naomi, and doing it in ways that she would have never thought possible. I don't know about you, but so many times, if not every time, I pray to God about a situation. Go before me. Help me, God. Forgive me. You know I created this problem, or I didn't create this problem, whatever it is, but you got to help me. There's no other way. I, I cannot conceive in my mind of any way to solve this problem. But there is one way. And just when I think that God's going to do it that one way, because it's the only way I can think of, he does it another way that I never thought. I never saw that door, let alone that it was open. But God did. And that's just his nature. And he does it like that, I believe, to help me to grow in the faith that I have uh, uh, in him. And so um, this invisible spirit of God, saving, redeeming, restoring, recovering Naomi and, and, and her, uh, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, in ways they would have never thought possible. And so last week, Naomi it said just happened, like, almost like coincidence, to find out that a close relative of her dead husband was not only available, he was a bachelor, but he was wealthy and he was willing to save the family according to the law. Not his own way, not for his own purposes, but according to the law of God. And it just so happened that he loved Ruth and Ruth loved him. And so, his name is Boaz. And uh, last week, we read the details about how Ruth met Boaz and told Naomi about him and how he was willing to marry Ruth to save the family and, and to save the family name because all the males are dead now and to buy back the property that Naomi and her family lost before they moved to, Boab, uh, to Moab. But of course, and this should not be strange to you if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, of course, there was one obstacle. There always is. I mean, it just seems to add drama to the story. I guess that's why God allows it. Maybe he allows it so that we realize in our own lives when there is obstacles, they're not without uh, God's knowledge. And he works right through. The, in, in essence, what happens is a, a situation becomes difficult. And then because of an obstacle, it becomes more difficult. It's almost like God says, you know, when I solve this problem, it's going to be spectacular, but not on the level that I want it. So add another problem to it. And we say, no, Lord, no, 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 please, no, no. This is bad enough. 
please, please don't add more to this. He said, no, I'm going to do it. You're going to grow from this. You'll see. You'll like this. <laughs> and you beg him, no, God, please don't do it. But he does it, right? And so it seems like that's what happens once we uh, invite Jesus into our life. There's always uh, obstacles. The good news is that unlike our past life before coming to Jesus, now Jesus gets to deal with the obstacles not us. And if you're a control freak, this is going to bother you. But even control freaks, when they walk long enough with the Lord, they come to appreciate this and they finally learn, hey man, hands off. Hands off. So for Naomi and Ruth, that obstacle was another relative, not Boaz, another relative who was closer to them in relations than Boaz. And according to the law of God, this other relative, because he was closer, he had the first rights to save the family and inherit the land. That was the obstacle. So in chapter 3, last week, at the end of the chapter, um, it, that chapter ended, I should say, with Naomi advising Ruth. And the advice to Ruth was this in chapter 4, the last verse. She said, Ruth... Uh, oh, it says, now Boaz went up to the gate and sat, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, uh, Ru, uh, Naomi told Ruth, sit still, my daughter, until you know the matter will turn out. For the man, that is Boaz, will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. And the reason I read Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 in the beginning is because Boaz in this story is a type of, of Jesus. He is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. In other words, when you read the book of Ruth, if you cross out the name Boaz and put Jesus, if you cross out the name Naomi and put Israel, and if you cross out Ruth and put your name or the church, the whole story becomes totally applicable to each one of us. So these are types. Remember, we say it here all the time. In the Old Testament, God gives us pictures to understand the principles in the New Testament. And God gives us the principles in the New Testament to understand the pictures in the Old Testament. Makes the Bible real easy to, to understand. So now we're going to pick it up in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 1. And it says, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. Now the gate would be like today, uh, would be our city hall, the gathering place where people and things are announced and like that, especially if you're in a small town. So Boaz goes up to the gate, to this place, and he sat down there. And behold, the close relative whom Boaz had spoken came by. So this is that guy. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. Why ten? Well, in the Bible, numbers have certain meanings. And if you know those meanings, as, as you read through the Bible, when you come to these areas of the Bible where these numbers are mentioned, it gives you a more full picture. So here... The number 10 in the Bible, I guess I should say first, is the number of completion, or you could say a number of divine order. So Boaz, being a, a real man of God, he's not a phony. Boaz is a real man of God. Every real man of God, every real woman of God, needs to know for sure that what he or she is doing is God's will. All right. And that is not determined by emotions. It's not determined by whether or not you'll be able to profit from your choice of what you think God's will is. All right. It's not. I know a lot of people today, you know, I just felt like God was telling me, you know, and, and I just want to follow my heart. The Bible says, man, do not follow your heart. Let that be the last thing you ever do. But so many people today <clears throat> are led by emotions. And you know what? <clears throat> there are pastors who know that. And those pastors, what they'll do is they'll stir the pot. 
And they won't really teach the Bible. Instead, they'll take little pieces here and there of the Bible, and they'll put their charismatic, cool spin on things. And then they get the music and the fog lamp and the lights and who, oh, oh, hey, hey, oh, and the people get so emotional. And at that point, the pastor takes full control, never really teaching the Bible. Well, my question to those pastors is, if you're not going to teach the Bible, how will the people get to know God? And how can the people ever come to know God's will in their life? They're going to be led by their emotions all their life, like little babies. Little babies are led by their emotions. We're not called to be little babies. We're called to start off that way. But then we grow into maturity, and that comes through the knowledge of the Word of God. Boaz is that kind of a person. He loves Ruth. He wants to marry Ruth. He wants to help the family, these two widows. He wants to do all those things, but that's what he wants. He has to make sure this is God's will because he's a guy who is not going to settle for any less, no matter what the cost, no matter what he may lose. We need to become that in our Christian experience. So if you're going to do that, like Boaz, first of all, you will have to do everything in your life biblically. I don't care what your 12-step literature says. I don't care what your therapist says. I don't care what anybody says. If you're going to do things in your life according to God's will, number one, you got to do things biblically, even when they don't seem to make sense to you. That's number one. Number two, you got to come to the place where you wait on the Lord. We all hate waiting. I understand. But there's no other way of knowing God's will except those two ways. And we see that here in Boaz's life. He's going to do things biblically, and then he's going to wait on the Lord. And then, if it's the Lord's will, the doors are going to open. That's the way it is. It always has been that way. So, it says that they sat down. Then, verse 3, then he said to the close relative, Naomi who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And if you remember, Elimelech is Naomi's dead husband. That's why she's a widow. And before, now we find out that before they went to Moab, they either forfeited, you know, foreclosure, or they sold their land. All right? So somebody else is in possession of the land. But according to the law, remember, a close relative who had the money could buy it back. And the person who owned the land had no say-so in it. Here's the money you paid for it. Here's the money you loaned the family or whatever. Give the property back to the family. All right? So he goes on. Uh, Boaz has this conversation with this closer relative. I'd like to give you his name, but we don't know his name. Look at verse 4. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, then redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me so that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So Boaz says, listen, according to the law, if you want to make the move, it's your right. Because you're a closer relative than I am. So this unnamed guy, this closer relative was probably... Elimelech's brother, probably. And Boaz is probably Elimelech's cousin. All right. So obviously the brother is going to have first rights to buy back this property. And he's a real estate investor. You're going to see here in a minute. Real estate investors, they love to multiply property. All right. So look at this guy's uh, response now. In verse five, then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, here we go, you must also, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Let me go back here to, he says, Boaz tells this other relative, if you will redeem it, then redeem it. If you want to buy back the property, you have first right to do it, then buy it back, he says. But if you will not redeem it, if you will not buy it back, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So the closer relatives tells Boaz, no, I'm going to take the opportunity. Back up, Boaz. I'm going to buy the land back. 
All right. Verse five. Now Boaz tells him the other part of the law. <laughs> then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the field, okay, you want to buy it, all right. But on the day you buy the field, don't forget, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And that close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, change of mind now, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption. You buy back the land, Boaz, for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So at first he says, I'm in, man. You step back, Boaz. I'm going to buy the land. I'm going to add it to my portfolio. And then Boaz reminds him, well, there's another part to that same law. Let me remind you. And then he backs out. He says, no, I can't. Boaz, you go ahead and do it. What is that law? Well, last week when we were in Ruth chapter 3, we talked about it. And it's in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10, where God says, and I'm just going to paraphrase, that a widow, all right, the, 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 the wife of a dead man, could marry one of the dead man's relatives, and then the family name would continue. You have to understand, a family name does not continue through a woman. It continues through a man. So <clears throat> that's one part of the law. <clears throat> the unnamed relative, he wasn't down for that. No way. I don't want that part. He wanted the property, but yeah. If you want the property, the other part comes with it. And then, of course, Leviticus 25, verses 23 to 27, God said that the same relative, the same relative who would marry into the family to continue the name, that same relative could also buy back the land that the widow had lost. Okay. In this case, that close relative, uh, and again, we don't have his name, and I'll tell you why I think in a minute, but that relative with the first right to marry into Naomi's family, the guy whose name, we don't know, uh, he refuses. And for that reason, I believe that his name is not mentioned. And number one, because he chose not to play the role of future generations in Naomi's family which was not only his right, but it would have been, according to the law, it would have been the respectable thing for him to do, okay? He's going to be humiliated in a minute because of the choice he made. We'll see that. But for now, what was his motive? Why didn't he go through with it? He said, oh, the land. Oh, I'm down for the land. Step back, Boaz. I got the money. Where's the land? I'll buy it. I'm ready to pay for it. And then Boaz reminds him of his other hat, the other part of the responsibility. And he says, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. What was his motive for refusal? It was selfishness. It was selfishness. Look at verse 4. When he thought that he could acquire the widow's land, he said, oh, I'll redeem it. I'll buy it back. But then in verse 6, when he realized that acquiring the land meant helping the widow's cause, he said, oh, he said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You see, according to the law, the nearest relative, who's called the kinsman redeemer. Right? One of these days, you're going to be in a, a messianic church where there's a Jewish people that are Christians, and they're going to mention a kinsman redeemer. And you're going to learn that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. That's why Boaz is a type of Jesus. But According to the law, the nearest relative, who would be the kinsman redeemer, had to marry the widow and have a child with her. And no matter how many other children were born first, that child would be considered the firstborn of the family. And if you know about the Old Testament, the firstborn of the family is the one who received all of the inheritance and so apparently this unnamed relative had other property and he had other children and he wasn't willing to sacrifice that. He thought about himself, not the law of God, not the measure of faith that he should have had, but he thought about himself. Boaz is like Jesus. He's different. He never considers himself. 
He always considers it. Jesus, did Jesus die for himself? No. He died for you and me. Yeah. And so Boaz here, he thinks not of himself, but of these poor widows. And he's always a, a gentleman, no matter what the situation, like Jesus is. If you remember in, in chapter 2, verse 4, he walks onto his field where all of his employees are at. And you know the relationship between employees and the employers, especially if you live in California. You know, our government pits the employees against the employers. And he created, our government creates unions and then they force and, you know, and it's all a game. And now we pay seven, ten dollars for a hamburger. We used to pay two dollars. But then our government said, you know, you got to pay the employees more money and therefore they have to raise the price of the product. You know, it's a mess. Biblically speaking, the employers were to love the employees and the employees were to love the employers. In what way? The same way God has loved all of us. If we had that going on, if we had the Bible as the center of our government, we wouldn't need unions. We wouldn't be paying that kind of money. Employees would be paid fair wages. But, you know, we got the game going on because there's corruption. There's sin in the world. Well, if you remember in chapter 2, verse 4, Boaz is walking onto his field. His employees are, you know, gathering the harvest. And nobody gives anybody a dirty look. Instead, Boaz greets his employees with love and respect. Remember that? Boaz, it said... It says, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, his employees, the Lord be with you. And they must have smiled back and they answered him and said, and the Lord bless you, Boaz. Wow. That kind of relationship between an employer and employee, man, we need that more than ever before. At least we do in this country. And now here in verse one, um, he greets his competitor uh, with respect. This uh, other relative who's unnamed, really undeserving of respect because of the choice he made, doesn't matter to Boaz. He still treats him with respect. He says, come aside, friend, and sit down. He says, hey, you scoundrel, come over here. We know who you are, and I'm going to confront you. He could have done it that way, but he doesn't do it that way because he's a godly man. Well, in any case, the close relative refuses to do the right thing according to God's law. So, because of that, we're never going to know his name. And he disappears into all history because he's just one more person who doesn't care about God's law. He cares about himself and his choices first. And those people, um, they're not important where all eternity is concerned. They're not going to be in heaven, and nobody will remember them. That's what we learned a few months ago in the book of Revelation. And so, you know, again, we don't know his name, and he just kind of disappears into all history. But Boaz is different. Boaz, he doesn't have to, but he steps in to do the right thing. And for that, Boaz is going to be remembered throughout all eternity. In fact, it's been approximately 3,500 years and who are we talking about this morning? Boaz. And you know what? In the book of 2 Kings, I believe it is, uh, King Solomon, the son of King David, he builds the temple, this big, beautiful temple. And if you read it, it gives you all of the details of the temple. And in front of the temple, there are these two massive pillars. Both of them have names carved in. The second pillar has a name carved in, it is Boaz. Boaz. Solomon remembered Boaz, and he wanted everybody to remember Boaz. And we remember Boaz today. And when we're in heaven, we're going to remember Boaz. And we're going to go back to Israel in March of 2025. And when we do, we're going to go to Bethlehem, and we're going to remember Boaz again. And so all throughout, and uh, that's something I like to remember, because if I choose, in spite of what I want, in spite of what I believe, in spite of my feelings or whatever, if I choose to do what the Bible says rather than what I want, my name will be remembered forever by God. 
And that's what I want. I don't care if you guys remember my name. I want the Lord to remember me. All right, verse 7. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other man, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. All right. So the first relative who had the right but refused to help the widows, the law says since he refused, he has to take off his sandal. And he has to hand it to Boaz, the guy who would do the job. And this is an act of humiliation. And for a, it, it doesn't give us, there are more details to this that are not mentioned here. But for a good while, the man had to go about town with one sandal, one barefoot foot and the other one with a sandal. Not only that, but at this moment, either Ruth and, or Naomi, by law, would have walked up to the man and spit in his face. By Jewish tradition, according to the law. So, it says that he took off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, and here's the announcement now that Boaz is making. You are my witnesses that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, remember, that is the dead husband of Naomi, and all that was Kilion's and Melon's. These were the two dead sons of Naomi. Melon was Ruth's husband. He died, remember? So he says, And all that was Kilion's and Melon's from the hand of Naomi, moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Melon, I have acquired as my wife. I will marry her. Why? To perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. I, Boaz, am just going to kind of disappear into the shadows. My life from this point forward is going to be in honor of the dead man, Elimelech. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? We're going to talk about that in a minute. To perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are my witnesses to this day. So by God's will, Boaz marries Ruth. And in, 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 in that, he's marrying into the family, and in doing so, he preserves the name of Elimelech, his dead relative, and Naomi's sons, all right? And Boaz buys back the family property, not for himself. He doesn't buy it back for himself. He buys, he buys the property back for the two widows, Naomi and Ruth, and the son who is going to be uh, born uh, through Ruth. We're going to find out at the end of the story that Boaz and Ruth are going to have a son. And everything that Boaz did for these widows is all going to go by inheritance to this son. All right? And uh, again, we're going to see that at the end of the story. Verse 11, And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, this is, they all together in, in, in unison now. I can see them shouting this. We are witnesses. And here he goes. <laughs> this is what they said after that. The Lord make the women who, the woman who is coming to your house, like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrata. And be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. You know, sometimes average people, they say things and they don't really know what they're saying. But you know the Bible and you take a second look and you say, whoa, did you just say that? Because maybe the Lord gave you a dream, or maybe you were in a scripture that morning in your devotions, and this person, sometimes they're not even Christians, and they say something, you say, whoa, that was the Lord speaking, not the person. That's what's happening here. So some people will say that here the people, they were wishing Boaz and Ruth and Naomi good luck or good wishes. Hey, good luck to you. We wish you the best. But good luck and best wishes are not biblical. I don't like it. People say, well, good luck to you. 
I can't help it. I turn around, man, and I offend some people, and I say, excuse me, I'm a Christian. There's no such thing as luck. Maybe your life depends on, on luck. My life depends on Jesus Christ, and I prefer him over luck or good wishes any day of the week. Some people, you know, it's politically correct today to say, oh, Oh, really? That happened to you? Well, you'll be in my thoughts and prayers. Hey, keep your thoughts. There's no power in thoughts. But if you're a Christian, please pray for me because I know from the Bible, Jesus will hear you. Pray for me. That's what I desire. So these aren't, you know, well wishes or, hey, good luck to you. No, these people were shouting, are you ready? Prophetic prayers. And if you have a pen and you have your Bible open, next to verses 11 and 12, write prophetic prayers. Those are very important. Because what these people shouted is exactly what is going to come to pass in the future. These are prophetic prayers. They're not driven by emotion. It's the Holy Spirit. That invisible third person of the Trinity speaking to Boaz and Ruth and Naomi through these people. And really speaking to you and I 3,500 years later because look what happens. In the past, in Genesis 29 all the way to chapters 33, I believe, maybe 32, you meet Rachel and Leah. And Rachel and Leah become the wives of Jacob. So remember, it was Abraham, his son Isaac, and then Jacob. And Jacob, he didn't want to marry these two women who were sisters, but he was tricked into it. So he does. And between Rachel and Leah, 13 children are born. Very important children. Who are they, if you know? Does anybody know? If anybody knows, raise your hand. There you go. That's right. Margarita knows. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. Not just your average 13 children. God had anointed them for a specific purpose. Were these children good children? Well, you know, depending by whose standards you want to measure, they didn't turn out to be drug addicts. But there was some scandal behind these people. Oh, let me tell you. So, I don't have time to get into all of the scandal. We're going to talk about one very significant scandal here in a moment. But for now, what these people were shouting, this prophetic prayer that they were pronouncing, what they were really saying is, may Boaz and Ruth have many children. May they be blessed with many children. I have four, and I tell you, I am proud to have four children. I only wish I could have had more. Okay, may Ruth and Boaz be blessed with many children and may their children be as important as the children of Rachel and Leah. And we're going to find out in the last verse of this chapter that one of their grandsons will become one of the most important people in all of the Bible. And... May Boaz and Ruth prosper and become famous in Bethlehem, they said. Well, is Ruth and Boaz famous in Bethlehem? If you go with us to Israel in March of next year, we're going to go to Bethlehem and you're going to see for yourself. The names Ruth and Boaz are almost synonymous with Bethlehem. You can't really talk about Bethlehem without remembering Ruth and Boaz. Of course, Jesus was born there, and that's the most important thing. But he wouldn't have been born there if Ruth and Boaz had not done what they did. And no credit to them. This was all by God's will. So, yes, they are famous in Bethlehem even to this day. Now, this last one is heavy, heavy, heavy. All right. Verse 12, look at it again. May your house, these people said, this prophetic prayer. May your house, Ruth and Boaz, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. I don't know. It doesn't say, but I can almost picture in my head Boaz 
pausing at this moment saying, wait a minute, what are you saying here? Because in Genesis chapter 38, we have one of the most scandalous stories in all of Israel's history. That's right. God's people, just like you and I, they are some scandalous little suckers. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so I want you to read the, the whole story later in detail. It's very graphic. Very graphic. We're talking about semen. Oh, you heard me say that, semen. And what these sons of Judah did, you're going to want to read the story later. I'm just going to give you the highlights now because these people mentioned this to Boaz. But in Genesis chapter 38, and this ties right into the story, so pay close attention. I don't want to lose you here, okay? In Genesis chapter 38, Judah, who is the father of the tribe of Judah, okay? When I meet him in heaven, I, I'm going to have high respect for him. But the dude was scandalous. Okay, you're going to see it here. Judah is the father of the tribe of Judah. And he marries a Canaanite woman that was totally forbidden by God. But he does it. And they have together, they have these three boys. And then Judah chooses a woman named Tamar. It's an arranged marriage. To marry his oldest son, his name is Ur, E-R. But before they could have children, uh-oh, Ur dies, just like Naomi's sons. All right? They died before they could have children. Well, according to the law, now all of a sudden Judah wants to, you know, go by the law. Maybe he realized by this time in his life he'd made lots of mistakes. According to the law, Judah gave his second son, his name was Onan, to become Tamar's new husband so that Together they can have babies and carry on the family name. You, you, you see the parallel here between this family and Ruth and Naomi. All right. So according to the law, Judah says, hey, Tamar, I have another son. You're going to marry him. And it's going to be just like Ur never died. Okay. It's going to be good. Well, it doesn't turn out to be good because the second son dies before he can have children with Tamar. Son number one marries Tamar. He dies. Son number two marries Tamar. He dies. Okay, this woman is like the Black Widow. I know a couple of women like that today, believe it or not. Okay, I'm not saying they're at fault, but it is. Just, I'll tell you what, I ain't marrying them. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so that's what we see here, okay? And um, so there is a third son. His name is Sheila, but he's very young. And so Tamar is uh, like Naomi, or like Ruth, I guess I should say. She is determined to be part of God's family and to make sure that the name of her dead husband continues through the generation. Tamar, like Ruth, is determined, all right? So Genesis 38, verse 11. I'm just going to read the story, okay? Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my son Sheila is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend to do this. All right. He's a liar because he was afraid that Sheila would also die like his two brothers. So, you know, dad, Judah, he's concerned. Every time this woman gets married, the husband died and now he got one son left. Right. So <clears throat> years pass. It says in verse 12, some years later, Judah's wife died. After the time of mourning was over, Judah and his friend Hira, the Adulamite, went up to a town called Timnah to supervise the shearing of his sheep. It was a celebration. And someone told Tamar, look, it's been some time now, but your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. Tamar was aware that Sheila had grown up by now. But no arrangements had been made for her to come and marry him. So she devises a plan. Women in the Bible can be very scandalous. Check this. This is one you're going to remember for the rest of your life. I'm telling you now. Pay attention. So what does she do? It says, <clears throat> then it says, uh, she changed out of her widow's clothing. Remember, she was waiting for Judah to deliver his promise, right? And she says, I'm done with that. She changes out of her widow's clothing and covered herself with a veil to disguise herself. Here we go. 
Then she sat beside the road at the entrance to the village of Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. And Judah noticed her and thought she was a prostitute. Whoa. But she had covered, or since she had covered her face. So he stopped and propositioned her. Let me have sex with you. I told you it's graphic. Let me have sex with you. He said, not realizing that she was his own daughter-in-law. Okay. Whew. How much will you pay to have sex with me? Says Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law. He doesn't know that yet. He says, I'll send you a young goat from my flock, Judah promised. So this is how he's going to pay the, that's how you paid the prostitutes in those days. I guess you gave them a, a goat, right? <laughs> but what will you give me to guarantee that you will send the goat? Tamar asked, hey, how do I know that after I have sex with you, you're going to come back with the goat? I don't know. She's pretending to be a prostitute that doesn't know Judah, Okay. And uh, in verse 18, she says, what kind of guarantee, or Judah says, what kind of guarantee do you want? And she said, leave me your identification seal. That is a ring that every man would have worn. And it's cord, the necklace that goes with the ring. So the ring would have been hanging from the, the necklace. G give me that and the walking stick you are carrying. So every man's walking stick was custom made. So Judah gave them to her. Then he had intercourse with her. I told you this is graphic. And she became pregnant. No condoms back then, I guess. I guess, okay? And she became pregnant. Afterwards, she went back home, took off her veil, and put on her widow's clothing as usual. Later, Judah asked his friend Hira, the Adulamite, to take the young goat to the woman and to pick up the things he had given her as his guarantee. Hey, Hira... There was this prostitute that I got with. Go back, take this goat to her and bring back my things. Would you do that for me? I guess he was embarrassed to go, so he sends his friend. But Hira went and he couldn't find her. And so he asked the men who lived there, where can I find the prostitute who was sitting beside the road at the entrance to Enam? And they said, we never had a prostitute here, they replied. So Hira returned to Judah and told him, I couldn't find the prostitute anywhere. And the men of the village came. They've never had, they said that they've never had a prostitute there. And, and then verse 23, Judah says, well, in that case, let her keep the things I gave her. Judah said, I sent the young goat as we agreed. I did my part and you couldn't find her. And he says, we would be laughing stocks of the village if we went back again to look for her. Right, we go back and say, man, that prostitute must have been hot. Both of them are coming back for more. Right, <laughs> this is funny. I mean, you can't help but laugh here. Uh, so, uh, in verse twenty-four, it says, about three months later, now Judah was told that Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has acted like a prostitute, and now because of this, she's pregnant. Oh, Judah is hot. Right? He says, bring her and let her be burned. And so they did. But as they were taking her out to kill her, Tamar sent this message to her father-in-law. And the message was this. The man who owns these things, the necklace, the ring, and the walking stick, he's the one who made me pregnant. Uh-oh. Look closely whose seal and cord and walking stick these are. And Judah recognized them immediately and said, mm, Tamar is more righteous than I am because I lied. I arranged for her to marry my son, Sheila, but I never went through with it. And of course, it says Judah never slept with Tamar again, understandably. But verse 27 says, now, this gets very interesting. And now we start to tie this into the book of Ruth. When the time came for Tamar to give birth, it was discovered that she was carrying twins. And while she was in labor, one of the babies reached out his hand, and the midwife grabbed the hand and tied a scarlet or blood red string around the child's wrist, announcing this one came out first. Remember the law of the firstborn. This is very important. This one came out first. But then the baby pulled back his hand, and out came his brother. What? 
The midwife exclaimed, how did you break out first? So they named the child Perez, which means breached. Okay. Then the baby with the scarlet string on his wrist was born, and he was named Zira. So it turns out Perez comes out first. He's the firstborn. And then came out the other kid, Zira. Now, very important. According to the law of the Bible, Judah's marriage was illegitimate. He had no business marrying a Canaanite woman. Okay. And his, I don't know if to call it his son or his grand or his grandson, whatever it was. I guess you could call Perez by both. He was his son and his grandson. He was, of course, an illegitimate child. Two acts of illegitimacy here. Okay. Very important. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 through, 23, verse 2, one verse, there is a law that speaks to this. And it says, if a person is illegitimate by birth, Perez, neither he nor his descendants, you ready? For 10 generations may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. No descendant of Perez could be a leader in the house of God for 10 generations. He couldn't be a priest. He couldn't be a prophet. He couldn't light candles. He couldn't even clean the tabernacle or the, temp or the temple. He could certainly not be a king. He couldn't participate in any of these things for 10 generations. Okay? Now, keep that in mind. And let's go back to Ruth chapter 4. And we're going to read the final verses here. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has borne him. So you have to understand that this child uh, being conceived by Ruth also becomes Naomi's child because Naomi is grandma now, right? Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. If I forget, please don't let me don't let me forget to come back to this at the end. Very important. And also the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed, which means worship, by the way. His, he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Here's where Genesis 38 starts to come into play, okay? Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Whoa. Why Perez? Because it's going back to that verse 12. God is asking you and I to remember that scandalous story, okay? <clears throat> now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. And Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David, King David. Go back, and how many generations is it from Perez to David? Count them. There are 10. 10 generations. Remember what God said in Deuteronomy 23, verse 2? If a person is illegitimate by birth, neither he nor his descendants for 10 generations may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Remember in 1 Samuel chapter 9, the children of Israel wanted a king. And Samuel said, please don't do this. You're breaking my heart. They said, oh, no, no, we want a king. He said, but you already have a king. He is God, the Father in heaven, and you have a king. Nope, we want a king. And God says, well, Samuel, they're breaking my heart more than they're breaking yours, but they want a king. Give them a king. And the Bible says that David was God's choice for a king, but the people decided on Saul. 
Saul turned out to be a big mistake for Israel. Just like Joe Biden. I, no, never mind. <laughs> Saul turned out to be a big mistake for Israel. But um, because God knew from the beginning that Jesus, our Messiah, would be the descendant of David going all the way back. God had a problem because Saul was the king and David seemingly had some issues because he was the descendant of Perez. But oh yeah, way back, God, through the law, but by his grace, formed a law that would remove David from the curse of illegitimacy. And so David becomes king. And so God was able to work through all of the scandal of his people to accomplish the plan that he had since the beginning. How smart, how brilliant, how genius is God when he can accomplish that, not in 10 minutes, not in 15 minutes, but over the span of hundreds and thousands of years, having his plan in mind, watching his people screw it all up over and over and over again. And yet, what God said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 comes to pass. He who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Why am I focusing on that? Why am I emphasizing this? Because this is our story. And unfortunately, it's going to continue to be our story because we're going to get it wrong and we're going to get it wrong and we're going to get it wrong and we're going to make all these mistakes and we're going to make bad choices, some of them on purpose because we're led with our emotions, because our desires are this, our philosophy is that. But we asked Jesus to come into our life a long time ago. He has come in. And believe it or not, he is working all of these things out in a way that his will is going to be accomplished. And listen, to put it in our modern vernacular, our modern words, I'm going to tell you this. I don't care what you've done. If Jesus is your God, listen, everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And all you've got to do is read your Bible every day to bring that to memory. And then you're going to live in peace in spite of all of your mistakes. Now, before I close, I wanted to go back to this. It says, Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Remember, cross out Naomi and put Israel. Cross out Ruth and put the church. Cross out Boaz and put Jesus. Ruth came into a relationship with the God of Israel through Naomi, an Israelite, a Jewish woman. Then Ruth gave birth to a child that would become the grandson of Jesus. In effect, a picture, a type, a genealogy of Jesus. And where do we find Jesus, this type, this genealogy at the end? In the lap of Naomi, who represents Israel. Why do I say that? I said it in chapter 1, if you don't remember. Israel, the Jewish people, gave us our Messiah. But they rejected him. They rejected Jesus to this day. But they gave Jesus to us. We realize we're just stupid Gentiles, but we realize, man, this is the Messiah. This is the one who could forgive me, who could pull my life together, who will give me eternal life. He'll lead the way for me. We go back to tell the Jewish people this. He said, no, 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 you're mistaken. The, the Messiah hasn't come yet. Oh, no, we say. Big trouble for the Jewish people. But in the end, we just finished the book of Revelation. What's going to happen? We are going to be taken away in the rapture, and then the eyes of the Jewish people are going to be open. They're going to say, Jesus is our Messiah. We missed it. In effect, just like Naomi and Ruth, the Jews gave us our Messiah. We will give the Messiah back to them once we leave here. That's the story. There are so many 
perspectives of our story here in the book of Ruth. I can't even begin to count them. And we, we could have spent 10 years in the book of Ruth. I'm not even kidding you. And we could have seen this from all kinds of different perspectives. But I say that to say, that's why God put this story in the Bible. And it's a true story. All of the events are real. If you ever go with us to Bethlehem, you will see for yourself. This is not just a story. This is a real event. And God included it in the Bible so that you and I would know how much he loves us. So that we can be confident that he's going to work things out in our life, no matter what mess we've made. And everything is going to be all right. And the day is going to come that we're going to see our Messiah face to face. And we're going to sing and we're going to dance. It won't be just an emotional experience. But we're going to sing and we're dance. We saw that in the book of Revelation. And we're going to love him and we're going to celebrate him forever and ever and ever. Not because we're just emotional people. But because we are students of God's word and we understand what he did for us. And that makes all the difference between, well, I'll just say it, ignorant Christians and informed Christians. God wants informed Christians. That's why he gave us the Bible. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Ruth. Thank you uh, how, for how you speak to us, Father. And every day you remind us that you love us in ways immeasurable. And you are at work in our lives, even though we don't see you. When we're honest with ourselves, we see your fingerprints all over our life. And Father, forgive us, because truth be told, we've sinned in the past. We're going to sin today, and Lord, we're going to sin in the future. So forgive us. We were born into sin. We live in a sinful world. At the same time, Lord, we rejoice in you, because we know no matter what our sin, we will not thwart that beautiful plan that you have for each one of our lives. But it is our prayer today, Lord, that you take us from the life of sin that we're living today, that we walk away from it, that we repent, that we turn from it, and give you all of our lives, holding back nothing, understanding that you could do a much better job than we could ever do. So, Father, we... Uh, end this book with that prayer, and we look forward to what you'll be teaching us again next week, Lord. Thank you. We love you. Remember all of the faces here on Zoom, and you know every one of their needs, Father. Speak to them, and those on Facebook as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to thank you guys on uh, Facebook for joining us. Joe uh, Rivera, John Collins, and Nancy, and all of you. Um, Nora. Thanks for joining us. Come back again next week. Same time, Naomi. Uh, God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. And we're going to go to Zoom now and see what these people have to say. All right. God bless you guys. All right. I think Stella had her hand up. Hi, Stella. Yeah, stop recording.